Welcome to the next episode in the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Uh, this time I'm continuing our look at understanding Ethereum with a presentation on Ethereum clients. Um, we're using a Creative Commons license for this particular video. I'd like to thank uh, Andreas Antonopoulos and Gavin Wood for making their materials on the Mastering Ethereum GitHub site available in a Creative Commons. Um, this entire video, these slides, and all the other content is available under this license. Um, and just a reminder that mentions particular blockchain projects should not be construed as an endorsement. All right, so I'm going to dive into taking a look at Ethereum clients. I'll talk about the networks, full nodes, talk about running an Ethereum client, talk about a JSON RPC interface, and remote clients. So an Ethereum client is a software application that implements the Ethereum specification and communicates over the peer-to-peer -peer network with other Ethereum clients. Uh, different Ethereum clients can interoperate so long as all the clients comply with the reference specification and the standardized Ethereum communication protocols. While different clients can be implemented by different teams and different programming languages on different platforms, they're all speaking in the same peer-to-peer -peer protocol and are following the same consensus rules. Therefore, all these Ethereum clients can be used to operate and interact on this same Ethereum network. Ethereum is an open source project, or in a way, it's many open source projects, and the source code for all the major clients are available under open source licenses. Uh, and typically free to download and use, uh, usable for purposes in line with those open source licenses. Open source software means more than simply free to use. And it also means that Ethereum is developed by an open community of volunteers and can be modified by anyone who wants to volunteer to join this community. And one of the benefits of open source is that more, uh, more eyes uh, means more trustworthy code. Um, you can actually see the formal specification of Ethereum if you look at the white papers and the yellow paper. Um, this is in contrast to, for example, Bitcoin, which only had its white paper and didn't actually go through and have a formal yellow paper designed for it. Um, instead, Bitcoin specification is essentially Bitcoin core, the, uh, the implementation of the client. Um, whereas Ethereum specification is documented in this yellow paper that combines an English and a formal mathematical specification. Um, this Ethereum formal specification, in addition to various Ethereum improvement proposals or EIPs, defines the standard behavior in Ethereum client. Um, and this yellow paper is periodically updated as major changes are made to Ethereum. As a result of Ethereum's clear formal specification, there are a number of independently developed uh, interoperable software implementations of these Ethereum clients. Ethereum has a great diversity of implementations running on the network, uh, which is generally regarded as a good thing. And it also will help in defending against attacks on the network because exploitation of a particular client's implementation strategy will just impact those clients. It won't impact all the clients running on the network. So let's take a look at uh, the Ethereum networks. Though there are actually uh, multiple Ethereum based networks that conform to the formal specification defined in the Ethereum yellow paper, which may or may not interoperate with each other. So we've got Ethereum, uh, you've got Ethereum Classic, which is um, you know based on Ethereum prior to the DAO hack, where um, you know mainnet Ethereum went off and returned the money to those who had lost money in the DAO hack. Ethereum Classic decided not to uh, hard fork the network. Uh, Ella, Expanse, Ubik, Music Coin, and many others uh, are also Ethereum-based networks. While most of these networks are compatible at the protocol level, these networks often have features or attributes that require maintainers of Ethereum clients software to make small changes in order to support the various networks. Because of this, not every version of Ethereum client software will run every Ethereum based blockchain. Uh, some of the main uh, protocol implementations that are out there are Parity written in Rust, Geth written in Go, uh, CPP Ethereum written in C++, Pi Ethereum written in Python, Mantis written in Scala, Harmony written in Java. 
Um, so we're going to take a look at a couple of the most common client clients, such as Parity and Geth. We'll talk about how to set up a node using the clients and explore some of the options. So question you might have is, should you run an Ethereum full node? Well, the health, resilience, and censorship resistance of blockchains depends on the blockchains having many independently operated and geographically dispersed full nodes. If one party was running all the nodes, then you'd have centralization and you'd no longer be a decentralized network. So having lots of parties running nodes is a good thing. However, running a full node does have a cost. A cost in you know maintaining the computer hardware and maintaining the bandwidth um, and so on. Uh, furthermore, each full node can help other nodes obtain the block data to bootstrap their operation, as well as offering an operator independent verification of the transactions and the contracts. Um, so there are benefits to doing it, but there is a cost. Uh, remote, you know, a full node running on the on a live mainnet network is not necessary for Ethereum uh, development. You can uh, develop Ethereum smart contracts in, in a test environment. Um, so you can do almost everything you need as a developer with a testnet node, which will connect you to one of the smaller public test blockchains uh, with a local private blockchain like Ganesh, which we'll talk about later, or for cloud-based Ethereum client provided by a service provider like Infura. Uh, but if you are running a full node, you're, you are going to have a, a data burden, you know, because every day, of course, more transactions will be on the network, more blocks will be on the network, and you're essentially running as a miner, um, and that's going to have a burden on your blockchain. Um, you also have the options of running a client, uh, a remote client, which doesn't store a local copy of the blockchain and doesn't validate uh, blocks and transactions. So you don't pay the bandwidth cost, and you don't have to have the storage cost. Uh, or for storing, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of blocks. Uh, these clients uh, can offer the functionality of a wallet, these remote clients, and they can create and broadcast transactions. Remote clients can be used to connect to existing networks, such as uh, a full node, a public blockchain, a public test net, or a private local blockchain. Um, in practice, uh, remote clients include things like WebMask, I'm mean, sorry, MetaMask, uh, which is a very popular wallet, some of the other wallets like Emerald Wallet, My Ether Wallet, or MyCrypto, uh, which are convenient ways to switch between different node options. Um, in fact, the term remote client or wallet can be used interchangeably, um, although there are some differences. Uh, typically, a remote client may offer additional capabilities beyond just the transaction functionality of a wallet. So um, now you don't want to confuse the concept of remote wallet in Ethereum with that of a light client, which would be similar to a simplified payment verification client in Bitcoin. Uh, light clients validate block headers and use Merkle proofs to validate the inclusion of transactions in the blockchain and determine their effects, giving them a similar level of security to a full node. Conversely, uh, Ethereum remote clients do not validate block headers or transactions. They entirely trust a full client to give them access to the blockchain and hence lose significant security and anonymous privacy guarantees. Uh, you can mitigate these problems by using a full client yourself. So what are some of the advantages of running a full node? Well, you know, choosing to run a full node helps with the operation, the networks you connected to, but it does incur some mild to moderate costs for you. So what are some of the advantages? Well, it supports the resilience and censorship resistance of the Ethereum-based networks. It can, the full node can authoritatively validate all the transactions. The full node can interact with any smart contract on the public blockchain without having to go through a third-party intermediary. Uh, the full node can directly deploy smart contracts into the public blockchain without a third-party intermediary. And the full node can can read the blockchain status on accounts, contracts, and so on, even while offline. The third, the uh, full node can query the blockchain without letting a third party know the information you're reading, which can be pretty important for privacy purposes. So there are disadvantages to running a full node, though. It requires significant and growing hardware and bandwidth resources. Bandwidth. Uh, because, you know, as transactions are promulgated across a network, your full node has to validate them. 
And then as blocks are promulgated across the network, again, your full node is going to validate them and again, pass them. Essentially, you're operating and you're forwarding all that stuff. Um, it can require several days to weeks, depending on your bandwidth, to fully sync when first started as you're downloading all that data across the network. And over time, you have to maintain it, upgrade it, and keep it online to remain synced. Um, and you know if you keep if you turn off a computer for long periods of time then the time to get it synced is going to you know sometimes be significant there are some advantages and disadvantages to using the public test net you know whether or not you choose to run a full node you may want to run a public test net node so what are some of those advantages and disadvantages um a test net a testnet node will need to sync and store significantly less data compared to mainnet. Um, a testnet node can sync fully in much less time, you know, basically because the testnet nodes don't have as many transactions and they don't have as many contracts on them. Uh, deploying smart contracts or making transactions requires test ether, which has no value and you can be acquired for free from several uh, faucets. Remember, a faucet is just an application that has some ether that if you send a request, it will send the ether to you. Uh, so you can test it out. Uh, and test nets are public blockchains with many other users and contracts running live. Um, there are some disadvantages though. Um, you can't use real money on a test net or runs on test ether. Consequently, you can't test security against real adversaries as there's nothing at stake. You know, there may be some hackers on the test net who are practicing things out, but they're probably not going to try to hack your contract. Whereas in real life, if you've got millions or billions of dollars tied up in that contract, the hackers will try and hack it in real life. Um, there are some aspects of a public blockchain that you cannot test realistically in a test net. Uh, for example, transaction fees, although necessary to send transactions, are not a major concern so it's consideration on a test net, since gas is essentially unlimited on the test net. Further, the test nets do not experience network congestion like the public main net may, uh, or in fact, uh, they might experience network congestion, but it won't be the same way the public network does. It'll be very different behavior on the test net, and therefore it's not predictable how your application might work in real life. Um, you can also simulate a local blockchain on your personal computer or your laptop. Uh, for many testing purposes, the best option is to launch a single instance private blockchain using Ganesh or another uh, local blockchain simulation that you can interact with without having other people interact with your blockchain. Uh, there's some advantages and disadvantages of public dis test net, but also some differences. The advantage is you don't have to worry about syncing. Um, you also don't have to worry about much data on disk because you're basically starting a brand new blockchain uh, and you're mining the first block yourself. So there's almost no data. You don't need to obtain test ether. Uh, Ganesh will start with some accounts pre-initialized with ether that's ready for you to uh, do testing and you can allocate additional ether to yourself as necessary. Uh, there's no other users in the blockchain besides yourself. And there's no other contracts besides the ones that you deploy after you launch it. Um, unless you use the option of forking off an existing Ethereum node, in which case you'd have some uh, existing contracts. However, there's some disadvantages to using your own local blockchain. The first is having no other users means that it doesn't it won't behave the same as a public blockchain. There's uh, no competition for transaction space or sequencing of transactions. Um, no miners other than you means that mining is going to be more predictable than it would be in real life. Therefore, you can't test out the scenarios that might occur on a public blockchain related to mining. Um, and if you're forking off of existing Ethereum node, it will need to be an archive node for you to interact with state from blocks that may have otherwise been pruned. So let's talk about running an Ethereum client. Uh, if you've got the time and resources, you can attempt to run a full node, even if just to learn more about uh, how Ethereum works. So um, you could download and try out the Ethereum clients, Purity or Geth. Um, you know, 
you might want to consider carefully, you know, uh, you know, how comfortable are you with the different OSs that are available and what OS you want to pursue. Um, keeping in mind that some of these clients are were written with the idea that you would be running Ethereum on a command line uh, capable operating system like Linux. Um, so what are the hardware requirements for a full node? Um, CPU with multiple cores, at least 300 gigabytes of free storage space, uh, four gigs RAM minimum, maybe eight gigs, uh, eight megabit second download internet service and recommended would be 16 gigabytes of RAM, a fast CPU, four plus core, four cores, um, a fast SSD with at least 500 gigs of free space and probably more for storing all of the data. I, I'd recommend uh, double that. I think you want at least a terabyte of free space um, and probably 25 plus uh, megabits per second download internet service just for dealing with all the blocks and the transactions. Uh, you also want unlimited data plan uh, because you're gonna have a lot of data being downloaded uh, to support Ethereum. And as I mentioned, you probably want to go with Linux. So let me go ahead and so yeah, I mean, realistically, it's best to have an SSD solid state drive. Uh, if you're just using an HDD, it's going to be a lot slower. Uh, also, I would not recommend an external drive because that's going to be slower too. You probably want it to be your hard drive in your computer, or at least built into your computer, so it's faster. Um, now, one recommendation is you might go with Parity as a, a client, uh, which is a little lighter weight than Geth. Um, but again, the blockchain size is going to increase. As it increases, more data is going to be needed. So assume that you're going to be able to uh, have a decent amount of data that you're going to have to store. Um, so let's take a look at some of the software requirements for building and running a, a client node. Um, so you're going to need an, a, a, several different software packages to deploy this stuff. Uh, and, you know, let's assume for the sake of argument that you're going to be running this on Linux. Now, obviously, there's multiple different Linux uh, flavors. You know, there's Ubuntu, there's GNU and so on. Um, but uh, the assumption is you're probably going to want to run on Linux. Now, you don't have to run on Linux. You could run it on something like Mac OS. Uh, or, and similarly, you could do it on a desktop or a laptop. My recommendation is that if you're actually going to be running a full node, your best performance is going to be on a Linux uh, desktop, you know, or server, um, as opposed to going with Mac OS. You can install and run all this stuff on Mac OS, but that's really just for playing around. If you're actually going to be running transactions and blocks, go Linux and go on a desktop or a server. Um, so assuming you want to go ahead and install one of these uh, client nodes, then you're going to need a number of software packages. You know, you'll, you'll need Git for getting the various software. Um, you know, assuming you're going with Geth, uh, which is a Go Ethereum client, then you're going to need a, a version of Go language, uh, which you can get from golang.org. Uh, Parity is written in Rust, so you would need uh, the Rust language from rustup.rs. Uh, Parity also requires some software libraries like OpenSSL. Um, so again, Parity is an implementation of a full node Ethereum client and a decentralized application browser. Um, it's, re it's released under GPL version three. Um, and to install Parity, you basically use a Rust man package manager or download source code from GitHub. Uh, here's a look at how you would install Parity. Basically, what you would want to do is go follow the instructions on the Parity wiki. Uh, install Rust, get the source code from GitHub, and then go ahead and install it. Um, and then once it's installed, you can check the to see you can invoke the version op option to see uh, what version was installed. Um, now, if you're installing Go Ethereum or Geth, um, Geth is the Go language implementation. Uh, and it's considered the official implementation of the Ethereum client. Um, 
you want to make sure you grab the correct version for your blockchain because there's different versions for the different blockchains. There's the mainnet, there's classic, there's music coin and so on. Um, so to install it, you want to get the pre-compiled binary for your platform. Go ahead and uh, download that particular version. You know, for example, here they're showing Geth for Linux, Mac OS, Windows, and so on. Um, then you want to compile it, assuming you've got Git and Go already installed. Um, you know, if you've got Git, then you just clone the, uh, the GitHub version of Go Ethereum, and then you go ahead and run your make. Um, and then you go and you do the installation verification and then run the client. So traditionally, when syncing an Ethereum blockchain, your client is going to download and validate every block and every transaction since the very start from the Genesis block. You know, very similar to how Bitcoin would approach it, uh, where, you know, if you install the Bitcoin uh, core, it will then download and, and go through every single block in the Bitcoin blockchain. While it is possible to fully sync the Ethereum blockchain this way, this type of sync takes a long time and has high resource requirements. Um, it needs more RAM, takes a long time, uh, multiple days, maybe weeks even, depending on how your fast your computer is and how fast your network is. So many Ethereum-based blockchains were the victim of denial of service attacks because, and this could cause the affected blockchain to sync slowly when doing a full sync. Um, and so Ethereum implemented a series of upgrades using hard forks to address the underlying vulnerabilities that were exploited in denial of service attacks. Those upgrades also cleaned up the blockchain by removing some, uh, by millions of empty accounts created by spam transactions. Um, so if you're syncing with full validation, your client's gonna take a while to deal with how to handle these denial of service attacks and these empty spam accounts. Um, so most Ethereum clients by now perform a fast synchronization that skips the full validation of transactions until it is synced to the tip of the blockchain, then it resumes a full validation. So Go Ethereum um, will do this fast synchronization by default. Um, other Ethereum blockchains will have their own specific instructions. Parity will also do a fast synchronization by default. So let's talk a little bit about the JSON RPC interface. Um, Ethereum clients offer an, eight, an application program interface and a set of remote procedure commands, which are encoded as JavaScript uh, JSON uh, comm API commands. You'll see these referred to as the JSON RPC API. Essentially, the JSON RPC API is an interface that allows developers to write programs that use the Ethereum client as a gateway to the Ethereum network. Usually the RPC interface is offered as an HTTP service. Uh, for security reasons, it's restricted to only accept connections from the local host. Uh, to access the JSON RPC API, you can use a specialized library written in your uh, whatever programming language you want that will provide function calls corresponding to each available RPC command, or you could manually construct HTTP requests and send receive JSON requests. Um, you can even use a generic command line HP client like curl to call the HPC uh, RPC interface. Um, so to do that, what you would do is you'd have Geth up and running. You'd configure it with the RPC command to allow access to the RPC interface. And here we've got this example command of how you would hooked up to it using a curl command, basically sending an HP message to interact and call a function on the TRPC API. So in this particular case, we're just passing the parameters in the ID. Um, so our JSON RPC request is gonna be formatted according to our JSON RPC specification. Each request is gonna contain four elements, the version of the protocol, the name of the method we're invoked, that's what we're actually calling, any parameters that need to be passed in to this method and identifier, uh, you know, identifying what's going on. So for example, if we look over here, 
our, our, we've got our uh, we've got our JSON RPC, which is 2.0. Then you've got our method here; it's Web3 client version. Uh, and then we got the parameters and the ID. The um, ID parameter is an identifier established by the client that's used primarily when making multiple requests. Uh, like uh, we're batching together several requests together. So let's suppose we wanted to do a JSON RPC query for the current gas price. So again, we're, do, we're basically writing some software code that's gonna run on our computer, talk to our local client and say, hey, uh, local Ethereum client, you're keeping up with what's going on in the Ethereum network. What's the current gas price on the Ethereum network? Um, so in my method, I put ETH gas price. Um, so I'm saying I'm calling this function ETH gas price on my API, and my Ethereum client should respond back and say, "Hey, the latest block told me the current gas price is X." Um, and so in this particular case, we find out that the latest gas price is 18 Guay, uh, which is short for gigaway or billions away. So remote clients for Ethereum offer a subset of the functionality of the full client. They don't store the full Ethereum blockchain, so they're faster to set up, but they're and they require far less data storage. And they still provide some capabilities. You know, they can manage private keys and Ethereum addresses in a wallet, uh, but usually they don't offer all these capabilities. They only offer some. So some clients only offer basic wallet functionality. Um, others are full-blown decentralized app browsers. Um, so typically they offer some of the functions of a full node, but since they're not synchronizing a local copy of the Ethereum blockchain, they have to connect to a full node being run somewhere else. So here are some of the things that they might be doing. They might be doing uh, managing private keys and addresses and wallet. They might be creating, signing, and broadcasting transactions. They might be interacting with smart contracts using data. They might be browsing and interacting with de decentralized apps. Uh, they might be offering links to external services such as block explorers. They might be converting Ether units or gas prices and exchange rates. Uh, they might be injecting Web3 instances as JavaScript objects in a web browser or using a Web3 instance uh, in the browser or accessing RPC services on a local or remote node. So let's take a look at some of the most popular types of remote clients. Um, obviously, mobile smartphone wallets are very popular for Ethereum. Um, all mobile wallets are remote clients because the smartphone doesn't have adequate resources to run a full Ethereum client. You know, keeping all the Ethereum transactions on a smartphone would be very painful. Uh, popular mobile wallets include the following, like Jax, which is a multi-currency uh, mobile wallet based on BIP39. Uh, Jax is available on Android and iOS as a browser plugin and as a desktop wallet. Status, which is a mobile wallet and decentralized app browser support for a variety of tokens and dApps available on iOS and Android. Trust Wallet, which is a mobile multi-currency wallet that supports Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, as well as ERC-20 and ERC-223 tokens. Trust Wallet's available for iOS and Android. Uh, Cypher Browser, it's a full-featured Ethereum-enabled mobile dApp browser and wallet that allows integration with Ethereum apps and tokens. And it's available for iOS and Android. Uh, and there's many others besides these. Browser wallets. Um, there's a variety of browser wallets and decentralized app browsers that are available as plugins and extensions of web browsers uh, for Chrome, Firefox, Brave, and so on. Um, and so all of these are remote clients that run inside your browser. Uh, some of the most popular ones are MetaMask, Jax, my Ether wallet, and my crypto. Um, you should be careful when uh, accessing browser-based JavaScript wallets as they're frequent targets for phishing. Um, so you should use bookmarks and not search engines or links to access the correct web URL. Um, MetaMask is a versatile 
uh, browser-based wallet, RPC client, and basic contract explorer. It's available on Chrome, Firefox, Opera, and Brave. Unlike other browser wallets, MetaMask injects a Web3 instance into the browser JavaScript context, acting as an RPC client that connects to a variety of Ethereum blockchains. The ability to inject a Web3 instance and act as a gateway to external RPC services makes MetaMask a powerful tool for developers and users. It can be combined with my Ether wallet and my crypto, acting as a Web3 provider and RPC gateway for those tools. Uh, MetaMask has some NF NFT functionality that's in the process of being built into it. My Ether wallet is a browser-based JavaScript remote client that offers a bridge to popular hardware wallets, such as the Trezor and the Ledger. It has a Web3 interface that could connect to a Web3 interface injected by another client like MetaMask. It's got an RPC client that connect, can connect to an Ethereum full client, has a basic interface, can interact with smart contracts. Given a contract is uh, ABI, the address and an application binary interface. Um, it's got a mobile app, MEW Connect, that enables you to be able to use Android or iOS to store funds. And it's got a software wallet running in JavaScript. My crypto uh, was a fork of the MyEther wallet project. Uh, my crypto offers very similar functionality to my Ether wallet, but instead of using MEW Connect, it, it connects to Parity Signer. Uh, like MEW Connect, Parity Signer stores keys on the phone and interfaces with my crypto in a similar manner as a hardware wallet. Um, so in summary, we took a look at several different wallets and um, several clients and how they interact. Um, I'm going to do some future presentations that'll dive into more details about how, the, how these wallets work. Um, but I want to thank you for uh, looking at this presentation where I talked about the fact that Ethereum clients are software applications that implement the Ethereum specification and communicate over the peer to peer Ethereum protocol. Um, you know, and I talked about the fact that a variety of Ethereum based networks exist. Um, but, you know, and some and we looked at the clients that can run on these Ethereum networks um, and depending on development purposes, you might run a full node or a remote client that depends on a full node. And I talked about the fact that there's a number of different clients out there, the two most popular, which tend to be Parity and Geth. Um, and depending on you know which one you're installing and your OS and so forth, you'd install the appropriate programming languages and other packages to run those clients. And we talked about the fact that remote clients exist, but they typically offer a subset of the functionality of a full client. So again, I'd like to thank everyone for watching this video on Ethereum clients. Um, and tune in next time when we go dive deeper into Ethereum. So again, thanks for watching this uh, video on Ethereum clients, part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett.